Hey, do me a favor, stand to your feet, come on. And I wanted to share all those announcements because I think it's exciting to know what everything that's happening in our church and what's taking place and what God is doing. And I'm really just excited to, to share this morning because I believe today we're really going to talk about the church and, 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 and just the church in general. And to know that our church is moving and God is moving through our church is a really powerful thing. And so let's go ahead and read 2 Chronicles 7.14. It's been the passage we've been on the last seven weeks. We are ending it today, last week in 2 Chronicles 7.14. And it says this. It says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the word. Thank you for what you're doing today. Thank you for what you're doing in our church. I pray you would speak, and I pray, God, that you would continue to move in our church and in our people. We love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. Have a seat. So today, what I'd like to talk about as we conclude our series called If, and I pray that by now, something has been stirring in you to say, I probably need to pray more. Come on. I probably need to focus on my prayer life. I probably need to allow Jesus to do some things in my life in the place of prayer. I need to make my relationship with Jesus not a Sunday date, but a lifestyle with him. Come on now. Because that's what prayer does. So we're going to focus on the first part. I'm going back to the top, right? Each week we've gone through a different chunk of that passage. Last week we talked about healing and the healing of our land and how God heals us and powerful stuff. I've got, I got in texts throughout the week of people who haven't been able to sleep. They're able to sleep for the first time in months and, 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 and pain leaving their body and, and, and just presence of God, the power of God, healing people's minds, healing people's physical body, healing people's heart. Come on, can we just thank Jesus for that, that he just showed up and he shows up every week. It's a lot of fun. It's cool stuff. I want to focus on the first part today, and it says, if my people. Everybody say, my people. My people. And what I want to talk about today is the church and prayer. The church and prayer. And so for the last seven weeks, we've been talking about prayer. But really, we've been talking about prayer and you, right? Your individual life with prayer. The way you pray, how to pray, how to deepen your own prayer life, how to deepen your own relationship with God. But today, I want to talk about our responsibility as a church together with prayer. Does that make sense? And, I, and, and the statement I want to make today, which I think is going to really tie in everything with the message, is this. Is that prayer is personal and public. Okay, I want you to understand something, that you got saved, if you got saved, if you haven't got saved, then come talk to me afterward, because hell's a really bad place. I want you to know Jesus. When you get saved, you now have a real relationship with Jesus, right? God wants to have a relationship with you. God wants to have a real relationship with you. God wants to make sure that you and him are good, right? And he, he wants to begin to know you and he wants you to know him. And so you get saved from what you've been through into this relationship with God, okay? That relationship is very personal. It's very real. It's, it's very invisible, if that makes sense. Like there's people that don't really know what's going on. And, and I think that's very important, and really that is a priority. But what we also have to understand is that not only does God save us from something, so he doesn't just save us from our past and from our sin, he saves us into a spiritual family. Okay? He saves us into the church, which for us, this is Thrive. But uh, Wayne Gruden would describe it as this, he's a theologian, at you are saved in what's called the global church or the visible church. Meaning that today, right now, because it's Sunday, there are millions and millions, if not a billion plus believers all over the world, right? They're in Africa, they're in China, they're in South America, uh, they're in huts, they're in um, portable buildings, they're in theaters, they're in uh, cathedrals. All over the world, they are meeting today together because we are part of something bigger than ourselves, which is the church. And that's beautiful. That's an amazing thing. Because oftentimes in life, 
especially in, in, in our culture and day and age, we are looking to be part of something. Have you, haven't you noticed that, right? Everyone wants to be like in the exclusive in, if that makes sense. Everyone feels good when they make it on the team. Everyone feels good when they are part of something bigger than themselves. And when we get saved, we become part of something bigger than ourselves. And, and I want to say this, that's not an option. That's a requirement, now look, I don't care if you go to Thrive as the lead pastor of Thrive saying that. Like that sounds kind of funny. I don't, I, I'm good. I'm good if you don't go here, not because I don't want you to, I don't want you to leave. I'm just saying. But I want you to be part of somewhere, a family of God, an expression of the family of God on earth. Why? Because as people who follow Jesus, this is part of what God has designed us and what has planned it. Um, I, I heard a quote from a guy recently, and he thought it was really, really good. He talked about how, how we express our salvation. Not necessarily that it's required, but how we express our salvation, we express it through the context of a local church, through a local family. And that could look all sorts of ways. That could be a missions base. That could be a, a, a homeless ministry that's reaching the lost and the broken. That, that could be a home church. That could be a big cathedral. I don't care what it looks like, okay? But it has to be part of it. And why am I kind of talking about this and I'm kind of rambling? I promise I'm going to make sense of it. It's because then once we become part of something, we now have an obligation to not only be part of a family bigger than us, which God has saved us into. Does that make sense? Is everybody following me? Part of the job description, if you would, of the church is we got to pray for each other. If, if you only, if, if your relationship with Jesus is only in private and never begins to leak out in your public life, then you are missing out on the entirety of the gospel that God wants you to live in. Let me, I'll rephrase it. If only the parts of your Christianity is about you and God and doesn't begin to relate with other people, either in a local church family context or loving on the lost and the broken, then you are missing out on the calling and purpose of God on your life. You have to get to the place where it is not about you anymore. You have to. I have to. We have to. It's what God calls us to do, where we have to begin to get to the place where no longer is it all about us. Self-centered Christianity has never saved anybody. And so why am I kind of putting this precedent? Because when in talking about prayer, I think oftentimes we think that the responsibility of prayer falls on pastors. And I want to tell you that that's not true. That the responsibility of prayer does not fall on pastors. The responsibility of prayer falls on people who say they love Jesus. I need to take my prayer life, my prayer closet, the thing that I do with me and God, I need to take that and make it public, meaning that I don't just want to pray for myself, I need to begin to pray for others. And not just pray for others when no one's looking, no. i got to begin to get into the place where I would begin to pray for others with them together, because that is in the very essence and DNA of who the church is. Our prayer is both private and public. And I want to just kind of give you some points. I believe that for us as a church... This is where the Lord is really leading us. That we would be a church that prays like never before. Because I believe when we pray, we've been just talking about it for seven weeks, if, right? If you pray, then this is what happens. We've been really talking about that in the context of if you pray, look what God does in your life. I want to broaden the scope a little bit. If we pray, what can God do with our church? Does that make sense? If we pray, what can God do with our house? If we pray, what can God do with our people? And to become a church that prays, we need a people that pray. It's really simple. A church doesn't pray because we have prayer meetings. A church is a praying church. A church is a church that focuses on the presence of God in prayer because their people focus on the presence of God in prayer. And so when we pray, I just want to give you some things. I want to give you some scripture that I believe begins to help us understand the importance of why Jesus has called the church to prayer. So number one is when we pray, we realize we have a spiritual family. 
we realize we have a spiritual family. Acts 2, verses 42 to 44. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture today because I feel like I want to back this up with a lot of Bible. Okay. When we pray, we realize we have a spiritual family. The Bible says in Acts 4, or Acts 2, verses 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. And all came upon every soul. Many signs and wonders were being done. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. All right, check it out. The church starts in the book of Acts. Literally, a bunch of crazy people decided to follow Jesus and believe that he was still alive. They went into a room. There's 120 of them. The Bible says there is a wind that came in the room. That the Spirit of God came in the room. All sorts of craziness. They leave the room. They start talking all this other languages. Peter gets up on some, I don't know where, some random stage or something. And he begins to preach. And in one moment, 3,000 people get saved. I don't know about you, but that's a good Sunday. Like, I wish, Pastor Ben, can we pray if that happens in the Instagram reel? You know what I'm saying? Like, that would be so dope to get that on TikTok. Fire. Good Sunday. And this is what they, so, so, so you have to understand, when the church started, this is very new. They don't know what they're doing. Like, sometimes we read the Bible as if we think the apostles had it all together. They didn't have it all together. Like, just, like, literally... Two months before, Peter's chopping dude's ears off. That's some gangster Stockton church right there. <laughs> he's chopping dude's ears off. And now he's preaching. And 3,000 people come to Jesus in a day. And they all got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Throwing the floor, yelling in tongues, proclaiming the gospel. And so imagine, like, I just, I, I, I love this story, like in Acts, because I think we live for the moment, right? We love the conference. I know I do. I love the conferences. I love the big moments. I love the hype. But then you know what's the worst sometimes is when you have to go home. And now all these people went home. And I can imagine the apostles were like, man, that was awesome. What do we do now? We don't have a church. We don't have a building. All of Rome hates us. I think we're going to cause a lot of drama. And so this is what they did. They said, let's meet in our houses daily. Let's have everyone talk about what we're teaching about because that's the gospel. Let's break bread. So let's have some donuts and cafecito. You know what I'm saying? And let's pray together. This is how the church started. It started over bread, the reading of the Bible, and we're going to pray for one another. And this is very, very important. Because what I've learned is this, is when the church takes one of those out, it becomes insufficient and anorexic, and it loses its power. You cannot have a church that's all focused on teaching and all focused on relationship, but does not include prayer. If you do not include prayer, you have created a man-made religion instead of a relationship that God has designed the church to have to be led by the Holy Ghost and not by a person. Why do we become a praying church? Why, are we, why am I so excited to really focus on prayer? Because it puts God back at the center of it. Consistently. Not that we never were a praying church. But to begin to put God more at the center of it. So then we would begin to understand and comprehend that Jesus is the one who leads this, not us. Because we need him. And I love this. It says they just pray. And can I tell you something? When you pray with other people you begin to realize you're not alone. Can I tell you, some of you, you just need to get someone to find, you just need to find someone to pray with you. Stop trying to pray on your own. Stop trying to do it all by yourself because you're not gonna do it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Like when you try to go to the gym and you're gonna go to the gym and you're gonna go to the gym and, and, and you don't go when it's by yourself, but if someone tells you, hey, let's go to the gym with me, you're gonna go and you're gonna show up when you don't like it. Come on, when you don't like it, but you will show up because that person peer pressured you to go. And then you will hate them for the next week because they put you on the Stairmaster. You know what I'm talking about. And some of you don't, but if you do, you know what I'm talking about. I have learned that in the seasons of my life, see, see what you have to understand is in the, in the New Testament church, incredible persecution. These dudes were dying for the gospel, right? They were getting stoned and martyred. And some of us, we think persecution is someone didn't like our Instagram video. Come on now. We don't know what it's like to go through real persecution. And this is how they were sustained. They just prayed with each other. 
So then that begs the question, if we as a church aren't praying for each other, what are we doing? And if I would deepen the question, if we as a church don't pray for one another, like not at home, but together in small groups on Sundays, if we're not, if we're not praying for our brothers, if we're not praying for our sisters, if we're not go, if I'm not going up to Juan and just praying for him or, or someone in, on our spiritual family, and not just me, but together, then are we even functioning as a church? I'm just asking the question. Don't, don't be mad at me. Because <laughs> it worked for them. The Bible says all they did was break some bread, talk about the Bible, and prayed. And it said many were added to them, and they had all things in common. I wonder if oftentimes in Christianity we complicate it. And so number one, when we pray, we begin to deepen the spiritual family. I think now more than ever, there's so many of us that just need family. I am grateful for my church family. And I need my church family to pray for me just as much as I pray for them. And, and I'm not talking just pray in your closet or in your car. I'm talking like get on the phone, pray through text. There's so many different ways, right? Send a video, meet up for coffee, and let's pray for another. You know what's one of my favorite things to do when I hang out with people like at Starbucks, right here at that Lathrop Starbucks, which by the way, side note, if you've never gone, they have the coolest sinks ever. Sorry, I'm in a building project, so I just like think all things construction. They got a sink, bro. That's you got to go check it out. It's got the soap, the the water, and the hand dryer on one. It's so next level. So next level. I was like, shoot, maybe one day, Jesus. You know my favorite? I usually sit in the big chairs because they make me feel cool. There's like these big chairs. I don't like to sit in the like the normal ones. I like to sit in the big chairs, maybe because I'm short. I like to sit in the big chairs. And I'm, I'm talking with someone. It could be about anything. It could be about life. It could be about deep stuff. It, not deep stuff. Pastors, whoever. And, and I, that's normally where I've been meeting people the last few months because we haven't been at the church. And I love saying, all right, let's pray. And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I pray there. Not because I'm super spiritual. It's just this, what you do either outside or in the room. Most of the time I pray in the room. And you know what's my favorite is when people start looking at us. I love it. Because they're like, what the heck is that weirdo doing? And it's not super deep prayer. Like, I'm not, like, calling down heaven, guys. Like, it's not weird. I'm just like, Jesus, pray you just do what you need to do in their life and protect their heart and bless their family. Like, like just the normal stuff. Like, generic stuff almost. Not, not meaning I don't mean it. I'm just saying. It's not, I'm not calling it, but you could just see. And, and you know what's interesting is they look, and first they're kind of weirded out, and then they are like, I, I normally I see, like, a nod. Like, they respect it. Why? Because they understand. They don't know what we're doing, but there's something precious and valuable in that moment. You know what I love? I love for when prodigals and visitors come to this church, that they get prayed for, not by a pastor, but by someone who just wants to love on them and know that they're blessed and God loves them. That's all. And they begin to connect with the spiritual family. Number two. Our hearts respond instead of react. When we pray as a church, it teaches us how to respond instead of react. And that's, and that's really, really important. I don't, I don't believe the church is supposed to be reactionary. I've said this a lot. We need to be careful with reacting to culture. It's not our job to just react, to be triggered. That's, that's not what we're going to do. We need to respond. And, and here's what I've learned. Um, prayer is powerful when it's your first response rather than your last resort. You know you're getting to a deeper place with Jesus when instead of the last thing you do, you pray, it's the first thing you do is pray. It's the first thing you think about when crisis happens. It's the first thing you think about when you get the promotion. It's the first thing you think about, right, is you begin to thank God and you begin to go into the place of his presence in prayer. We have to get to the place as a people where instead of just treating prayer as the last thing we do because we need something, we are so in love with Jesus that it's one of the first things we do, whether it's good or bad times in our life. This is the difference between responding and reacting. Reacting is just trigger moments that allows our emotions to get out of hand. Responding is thoughtful, it's methodical, it's strategic, and it gives God permission to enter the situation before we just move in our own humanity. Does that make sense? Acts chapter 12 says this, And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, right, this was the leader of the Roman Empire, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Acts chapter 12, verses 3 through 5. This was during the days of unleavened bread, verse 4. And when he had seized him, 
Peter, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. Verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Come on now. James just gets martyred. James is one of the original apostles, the disciples. They just kill him in the streets of Jerusalem. And because the people love that he died, the Roman people, the leader of the Roman Empire says, you know what, let's lock up Peter too. They find Peter, lock him up. Now, I don't know about you, they put four quadrants, four squads of soldiers. Like how dangerous is this dude, do they think? That four squads, which is anywhere between eight to 10, right? 30 to 40 people are taking shifts guarding this guy. That's how next level Peter is. That's how powerful God is moving through Peter's life. And the Bible says that instead of the church panicking and instead of the church freaking out, they pray. And you know what happens later on in the verse? The Bible says that an angel goes to the jail cell, knocks out all the soldiers, and frees Peter to continue to preach the gospel. (laughs) Family, the early church is setting a precedent for us. When things go wrong, what do we do? When things go wrong, how do we respond? And I think that's so important for the DNA and the culture of our house for the future. Because I'm not just thinking now. I'm thinking five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years. There's going to be things that don't go right. There's going to be things that happen. There's going to be things that take place that we're not going to want to take place. But is our response to complain? Is our response to just nag? Is our response to flee? Or is our response to pray? And do you notice how powerful it is that it says that the church of God came together and began to pray for Peter. And God began to move. I believe that when we gather together, God begins to move. We ha- it, 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 it gives us the time to respond. Haven't you noticed that you're not going to do something dumb when you pray? Have you ever like tried to pray instead of doing the thing you really want to do? Have you ever prayed over that text before sending it to your boss? If you haven't, you should. Because that's maybe why you got that's maybe why you got fired. I'm just saying. Should have took a moment. Ask Holy Ghost, help me with this. I'm telling you, it gets our hearts ready to respond. Number three, I believe that when we pray as a church, again, this is not just individual, I'm talking about corporately, I'm talking about together. When we pray together, heaven notices and hell is put on notice. When we pray, heaven notices and hell is put on notice. I believe that if we want to get the attention of heaven, the people of God need to go after him in the place of prayer and worship. I believe if we want to get God's attention in things, there's something that happens when his people begin to pray. That's what it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people... Not just if my king, not if my pastor, not if my leader, not if my husband, but if my, or my wife, but if my people, if my people, if my kids and my young people and my older people and my married couples, if my church, if my people begins to pray, begins to humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. I will begin to move. You want to get the attention of heaven on your life? Learn to grab arms with someone next to you. Learn to find someone who's in this thing with you. Learn to pray with your spouse. Learn to pray with your family and watch heaven begin to get attention on your life. If you're feeling like God's distance is distant from you, get around some people to pray with. Get around some people to talk to God about. I'm telling you, it's powerful. That's why it's so important we show up on Sundays. Because we're not showing up for us. We're showing up for him and we're showing up for someone who might need what we have on our life to help them through that season. Sunday attendance is not important because God's checking off a box. I could care less about that. But God wants his people to gather because when his people gather, heaven begins to notice. God begins to move. And hell is put on notice. I believe hell hates a church that prays. He ain't scared of churches who don't pray. 
He's not scared of a church who is running a religious man-made system. He is scared of a church who is calling upon Jesus and is trusting him. And in that trust, the, the, the gates of hell begin to get pushed back, right? Darkness begins to get pushed back in people's lives. I'll prove it. Acts 16. It says this. And about midnight... Paul and Silas, this is verse 25 and 26, Acts 16. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Come on now. I love that story. I could do a whole series on that story. The Bible says Paul and Silas are in prison. That prison was bad. It was all crazy. They're in prison for preaching the gospel. I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a season of your life where things you're doing are right, but yet everything is still going wrong? You ever been in a season in your life where you thought you're the good guy, or you thought you're trying, and you really are trying, and you're being wholehearted, and yet everything is chaos around you? That is literally Paul and Silas. And literally what they decide to do, they don't complain. They're not sitting there thinking they're going to die. I could just imagine randomly, Paul just looks to Silas and is like, hey, we should start singing and praying to Jesus in prison. When's the last time you sang through your storm instead of hiding from it? When's the last time you began to pray through the hurricane in your life? The last time you began to pray in the prison season in your life. And the Bible says that because two of them began to pray and sing to God, that heaven began to notice and hell was put on notice and the gates were open. Everyone's bondages were unfastened. I'm telling you, you want to see breakthrough in your family? You want to see breakthrough in your life? You want to see healing and freedom begin to take place? Begin to pray with some other people and go after God in the crisis. When I'm going through it, I, got, I know who I call. And man, I can tell you that there's times where I, I don't feel it, man. I want you to know that, that I don't, like, I'm not the most super spiritual person every day of the week. There are seasons I just don't feel it. I don't feel God's presence. I feel like I'm not hearing Jesus. That is normal. Just some of you that are like, I don't know if that's normal. It's normal sometimes. But I, when I get around some people, when I get around the people that I trust and I love, they begin to pray for me. I begin to feel like heaven's paying attention again. Not that he's ignoring me because he hates me, but because he's trying to build something in me. And man, I could feel it. The enemy, he gets angry. He gets upset. He'll start, he starts thinking he can do things all sort of ways and try to do things sideways to you. But I'm telling you right now that hell cannot stop what heaven has its eye on. Hell cannot stop what God has his favor on. And so let's take it in a broad sense. A church that prays. Paul and Silas in prison. A church that prays. Begins to see God move in their midst. Heaven begins to notice the church that prays. And hell begins to be put on notice. I believe that when we pray, prodigals come home. That when we pray, lives begin to be healed. That when we pray, marriages begin to be restored. That as a church, when we pray together, God begins to move. Why? Because what we're telling hell is you don't have authority anymore. You don't have a place anymore. You don't have a position anymore. You don't have room in their life. I know they've been an alcoholic for 20 years, but now you don't have authority in that place anymore. You don't have authority in that heart anymore. You don't have authority in that marriage that's been struggling anymore. Why? Because we're asking Jesus to intervene now. And lastly, when we pray as a church, we make room for Jesus to move. It's that simple. I have learned that more often than it is me getting more of Jesus, more often it's me getting out of the way for Jesus. You know what I'm saying? I just got to get out of the way. Because how many of you know we complicate things, y'all? Family, you don't even know what you're going to eat after church today. Come on. You're going to get in the car. Fellas, I feel for you. You're going to ask your wife what she wants. And she's not going to know what she wants. Pastor, why? <laughs> and then, like, I, I try to do it the other way. What do you not want? 
and it don't work. That's just food. And then finally, when your wife picks what she wants, let me just help the ladies out. Your husband doesn't want it. And you're like, we ate that yesterday. Like, I give up on life. Like, just go home. Eat air. We're so complicated. We're so complicated. That's just food. Think about everything else in life. We just complicate everything. And, and I love what I love about prayer is it's simple. It uncomplicates it all. It, it, un, it, 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 it untangles the mess in our life. I've just learned, God, I just want to get out of the way. God, let me get out of the way. That's surrender, right? That's trust. That's just my personally. So, so then in a broad sense, I want to get out of the way of what God wants to do in our church and in our house and in our people. Don't get me wrong, I want to be intentional, but I, but I want God to have the final say. I want, I want God to speak. I want God to move. And, and when we pray, it creates space for God to move. It says it in Matthew chapter 18. You guys have all heard this verse. If you haven't, Matthew 18 verses 19 to 20. It says, again, I say to you, if two, or two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Our prayer can't just be private. We got to get it to the place where it's public so that we can make room for Jesus to move. So we can make room for Jesus to move. So we can make room for Jesus to move in our homes. Families, I'm, let me talk to the married couples with kids. If the only time you pray on Sundays is at church, you're missing out. Your kids need to see you pray with them. And not when someone passes away or there's a tragedy. Don't wait till then. Build a place in your home, in your heart, where you would pray with your kids. Where you'd pray with your family. Learn to join a group and, and jump in so that you can pray with another. Find someone who you can call. If you were to ask yourself right now, who can I call to pray with me? And they would answer. And family, if you don't have someone, we got we to change that. Because we're in this together. We need to make room for Jesus to move in our lives. I'll share the story and I'll close. I remember when I was a, a missionary. I was a missionary for a couple years uh, in the United States. So I tell people I was a fake missionary because I was in the United States. Whitney was like a real missionary. She was like in Africa and stuff. I was like a fake missionary. Um, I like still had air conditioning and you know what I'm saying? So, um, but I was, I, was, I, was, I was a missionary to college campuses. I lived in the East Coast for a while. And um, I had a guy from England. His name was Nick Holt. He was my leader. And um, he was my roommate. He was my leader, a British guy. Uh, and he was totally British. Like, I don't know if you ever met British people, but sometimes they're rude. I'm just going to be honest. i um, not trying to be stereotypical. I'm just being honest. Like, he was very blunt to the point. Typical British dude. And um, he was much older than me. He was almost about to be 30. I was like 18, 19. And then one day, he, he, he would wake up early to pray because he was legit. He would wake up early to pray. And then out of nowhere, like, he wakes me up. Now, I mean, like, he wake up like at 6, 7. Some of you, that's not early because you commute. But for me, that's early. I'm just going to be honest. Still early, I'm just going to be honest. And, uh, and, and he woke me up one morning, and he's like, hey, I just feel like I want to pray for you. So I was like, oh, okay, bro. So, like, I'm standing up. I'm kind of falling asleep, to be honest. And, and he just begins to pray over me. And, and uh, I don't know if you know this, but Thrive is a church that believes in the Holy Ghost and the gifts. So uh, he begins to pray over me over t in tongues. He begins to pray in the spirit over my heart. Puts my hand on my chest. He begins to just pray over me for about five minutes, just in tongues. And I want you to know that that's okay. So some of you are like, that's weird. It's not. We can talk about it later. But that's the church you go to. We're a tongue-talking church. I'm just going to be honest. Okay. And then I was like, okay, cool. So I go back to sleep. He does it the next day. He does it the next day. He does it the next day. And literally for about six months, he would wake me up every morning and he would just pray over my heart. He would just pray, he would just pray, he would just pray for me daily, just in the spirit. Nothing big, nothing spectacular, nothing loud, just pray for me, just pray for me, just pray for me. And then he moved back to England, right? He left, he moved back to England. And I remember the first day that he left and I woke up in like in the, in the early morning because I thought he was gonna wake me up and he wasn't there. And I was like, wow, I'm missing this. 
I realized that the power wasn't in the special prayer. The power was in the consistency of someone else praying for me. God walked me through so much in that season. So I, I remember asking Nick years later, like, why did you pray for me every day? He's like, I just felt like God wanted to do something deep in your life. And you just needed someone to come alongside you to know that you're going to make it. That was it. And he did. And I'm grateful for that season. And I, I, I always remember that because, man, what if we would pray for another? What if we would pray for another like that? Because there's power when we pray for one another. Jesus says there is power when two or more are gathered. He's in the midst. So do me a favor. Stand to your feet. Come on, we're going to let you go.